Again, we know that the uh, delivered power from a source is equal to the net power along the transmission line, which is equal to the power that's absorbed by the load. We further know that the uh, net power is equal to the difference between the incident power and the reflected power along the transmission line. Now, there's one other kind of power that we have yet to talk about with respect to transmission lines, and that is the available power, the available power of the source. How is the available power of the source related to its delivered power? How is it related to incident and reflected power? How is available power related to the absorbed power? And how can we extract the, uh, all of that available power? How can we maximize um, the delivered power from the source, maximize it all the way up to its maximum possible value, its available power? And so that's what we are going to uh, examine in this unit. So again, we know the delivered power from the source is the difference between the incident and reflected, the net power. And since the transmission line is lossless, that delivered power is likewise equal to the absorbed power. So students, again, hopefully, and hopefully you've uh, made sense of this and understand that point. Further, I hope we understand that if we have a special case of a matched load, a load that's numerically equal to uh, the characteristic impedance of the uh, transmission line, numerically equal to Z0, then that will result in a reflected power which is equal to zero. And so in that case, and only in that case, the incident power will be delivered uh, equal to, the, will be equal to the delivered power uh, uh, from the source. Um, uh, and likewise, of course, once again, by conservation of energy, that also would be equal to the power absorbed by the load. So this is the special case where this equation happens to be true. Here is where a student's thinking about uh, power on a transmission line can uh, go off the rails. And this is where we introduce the uh, uh, concept of available power of the source. And so the uh, rationale would go like this. If uh, we make the reflected power go to zero, we reflect none of the incident power, and the absorbed power is the difference between the incident and the reflected power. By turning the reflected power to zero, we have maximized the power absorbed by the load. And by definition, if we have the maximum power absorbed by the load, we have, in fact, extracted all of the available power of the source. If the absorbed power is maximized, then the deliver power must be equal to the uh, available power. That was the definition of available power after all. So it seems logical. And I can't blame students for coming to this conclusion. The important thing about that is it is absolutely false. Absolutely false. It is true that delivered power, if if we have a match load at the end, the delivered power is equal to the incident power, and that incident power is equal to the absorbed power, but generally speaking, it will not be equal to the available power. It's that last inequality that, in fact, is not true. When we look at our uh, conservation of energy equation here, uh, again, we say, gosh, if I go through and I make this reflected power go to zero, uh, then that should maximize the absorbed power. The absorbed power is the difference between these two things, the incident reflected, I'll make this go to zero. <clears throat> there is no absorbed power that can be larger than that, it would seem. But here's the problem, and this is the most important point and something you need to pay attention to and think about carefully. And we've talked about this before, the idea that we don't have a causal situation where the source creates the incident wave and then the incident wave creates the reflected wave. It is likewise true that the reflected wave interacts with the source and then creates part of the incident wave uh, itself. And so there's an interaction between the two. So if we go through and we set our load to be a match load, which does minimize the reflected power, it might likewise minimize the incident power. And in fact, in a second, we'll find that is exactly what happens. The load that minimizes the reflected power is likewise the load that minimizes the incident power as well. The delivered power is the difference between these two. And so we'd like to find a load that minimizes the reflective power and maximizes the incident 
incident power. Now, such a low in general does not exist. Um, and so we have to have a compromise solution that uh, uh, maximizes the difference between those two. The load we find that will maximize the delivered power, that will maximize the difference between the incident and reflected power, is not a load that will minimize the reflected power, nor is it a load that will maximize the incident power. It is one that simply maximizes the difference between those two. So that's the problem. As we take a load and we, let's say, move its value toward a value of Z0, the reflected power will diminish towards zero, but the incident power will diminish as well. And so just mathematically, we've seen this before with respect to V0 plus the amplitude of the plus wave, it depends on the load at the end of the line. As we change the load at the end of the line, the value, the power of the incident wave will, um, will be affected. And so we can see that the incident wave right here depends on gamma n, but gamma n depends on the load at the other end of the transmission line. So if we could somehow keep this constant and change the reflection, the reflected power only, yes, in that case we'd have the load that sent this to zero. But again, as we send this reflected power to zero, we find we will likewise begin to diminish and minimize the incident power as well. Now I don't provide a proof here, but uh, I will make the statement that uh, when you have a match load, yes, the reflected power goes go to zero. The match load is the load that minimizes the reflected power. But, and again, I don't prove this, but it is true, the match load is likewise the load that will <coughs> uh, minimize the uh, incident power as well. Uh, and it kind of makes sense. I give sort of a heuristic reason for this. Remember that the incident power, the power coming down the transmission line to the load, remember when we did the analysis, it has two terms. One of the terms depends on the source, and we can say that that power is due to the source itself. The other term depended on the load at the other end, uh, the V0 minus, uh, the, the, the power of the reflected wave. And what happened is the reflected wave comes down and strikes this source, and part of that reflected wave is reflected back uh, toward the um, uh, load again itself. And of course, this happens multiple times and we reach a steady state solution. But again, we can't say that the incident power creates the reflected power any more than we can say the reflected power after it bounces off the source creates the incident power. They are coupled together. If we remove the energy flow down the line from the load, then there's less energy that can be reflected at the source. And that will, again, um, cause some diminishment in that uh, incident power. Moreover, the power that is delivered by the source, uh, that portion of it is also affected by the load uh, at the other end of the transmission line because the load at the other end of the transmission line affects this input impedance and therefore how much of this power will then move into uh, that transmission line. The bottom line, therefore, is that when we have a match load, even though it does minimize the reflected power, minimizes it all the way down to its minimum value of zero, we don't have a situation where excuse me, where the absorbed power is maximized. The difference between the incident and reflected is not maximized by a, uh, quote, uh, uh, match load. And therefore, the power that is delivered by the source is, generally speaking, less than the available power. Again, a matched load, even though it makes the reflected power zero, does not make the delivered power equal to the available power. This is a mistake that students make over and over again, that when we have a matched load, the delivered power must be equal to the available power, and that is not the case. So we might approach the problem from the other direction. We say that uh, um, the absorbed power is the difference between the incident power and the reflected power. Uh, the load that minimizes the reflected power is not the load that um, maximizes the difference between the two. Uh, maybe what should we should do is try to maximize the incident power. And so we ask ourselves, what load would maximize the incident power? Perhaps that would be the um, load that uh, would absorb all the available energy of our source. Well, it turns out the load that will maximize the incident power is, in fact, a reactive load. 
Again, I won't give a uh, proof here, but we can give talk about it heuristically. If I have a reactive load, then all of the incident power is reflected. All of the incident power is reflected back to the source, where again, it's once reflected and adds to the incident power. And so we have a situation then, again, this happens, you know, in infinite infinite number of times until we reach a steady state uh, uh, steady state solution there but um, ironically the uh, load that will maximize the uh, incident power uh, along the transmission line is a reactive load and of course that load can absorb no power well if a load can't absorb any power then the by conservation of energy the power delivered by the source is equal to zero as well Again, sometimes this uh, crosses students up. If we have a reactive load, it can ab absorb no energy. And if that load can absorb no energy, then the source is delivering no energy. Again, we're talking about a steady state solution here. The source has been on forever and uh, will be on forever. And so if no energy is coming out of the transmission line and no energy is coming out, if this is reactive, then there, in fact, there is no energy coming into the transmission line either by conservation of energy. So the load that maximizes the incident power is is reactive unfortunately that is the load that causes the delivered power to drop to its minimum value of zero this might be uh, getting frustrating here it turns out the load that maximizes the absorbed power is not the value of the load that minimizes the reflected power that is the match load of Z0. It's not the load that maximizes the input power. That's a load that's purely reactive. And so the question is, what load does maximize the absorbed power? Well, it's whatever load maximizes the difference between the incident and the reflected. Again, the load that maximizes this difference is not the load that minimizes the reflected power, nor is it the load that maximizes the incident. It is simply the load that minimizes the difference between the two. Remember, the load impedance will affect both the incident power and the reflected power, and so we find the one where this difference is maximized. Under that condition, then, because it's maximized, the power absorbed by the load is the power delivered by the source, of course, but more importantly, Importantly, it is the power then that is available from that source. The question is, what is that load? What is the load that will maximize the difference between the two? In other words, the load that will maximize the power delivered from its source. The load that will create the delivered power that is equal to the available power of that source. Now, you know what that answer is. The load that terminates a transmission line, the load value uh, that terminates a transmission line that will cause the source to deliver all of its available power is the load uh, of a transmission line that will create an input impedance that is numerically equal to the complex conjugate of that source impedance. For this source to deliver all of its available power, we know the load attached to it must be numerically equal to the complex conjugate of Zg. We must have a conjugate match. Again, in this case, the source is the fixed value. It is what it is, and it has a certain amount of available power. We're trying to figure out what load to attach to it to extract that power, extract energy at its maximum rate, its available power. And we know the load that we need attached to this source here to extract energy at its highest rate, its available power, we need to attach a complex conjugate match to the source. So Zn must be equal to Zg. And therefore, ZL needs to be whatever impedance it needs to be to create an input impedance equal to this complex conjugate. So what load will create an input impedance, which is numerically equal to the complex conjugate of the source impedance? Again, we look at our transmission line as a two-port impedance transformer that will transform ZL into some specific value of ZN. This is a problem where we're trying to work it backwards. We know what the value of ZN needs to be, and so we ask ourselves, what should the value of ZL be to create the requisite ZN? Of course, the relationship between the load impedance and its input impedance depends on a number of things. Obviously, it depends on the load impedance, but moreover, 
over depends on the characteristic impedance of that transmission line. It depends, in this case, on the source impedance that we're trying to make our uh, Z and the complex conjugate of. And most annoyingly, it depends on the length of our transmission line. Now, with the Smith chart, we could solve this problem. We have some value of Zg. We say Zn needs to be the complex conjugate of that value. If we have a transmission line of a given characteristic impedance and uh, electrical length, we could use a Smith chart and we work the problem backward. We did an example of this where we have a input impedance that we desire and we tried to figure out what the load impedance would be. And so in that case, we're mapping parametrically in the complex gamma plane on our Smith chart. And in this case, we are rotating counterclockwise, counterclockwise um, um, around the Smith chart as we parametrically plot gamma. We rotate back a uh, electrode length of, uh, of uh, beta L and, um, and uh, the, uh, um, <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, two beta L rather, and uh, that would uh, give us the right value. Uh, on the Smith chart. But this is a very complex problem then. Um, it's not just a simple answer. We have to figure out whatever value of ZL, given our transmission line characteristic impedance and length, would give us a ZN, which happens to be the complex conjugate of ZZ. If we do all that, then we are extracting all of the available power of our source, and therefore all that available power is absorbed by our load. Again, we can show that the um, quote-unquote matched load that we have here, meaning that its uh, impedance is numerically equal to Z0, does not create a conjugate match. If we have a matched load numerically equal to Z0, then we know the input impedance is going to be equal to Z0 as well. It's a special case. We know the input impedance uh, will be Z0 regardless of the length of the transmission line. So we don't even need to know what the length of the transmission line is if this load is numerically equal to its characteristic impedance. So Zn is equal to Z0. But in general, Z0 is not going to be equal to the complex conjugate of our source impedance. Our source impedance is just some arbitrary value. We have made no uh, restriction on the value of that source impedance. And so the input impedance may be 50 ohms, but the uh, source impedance may be 10 minus uh, 5j or something like that. Well, we don't have a conjugate match in that situation. And because we don't have a conjugate match, then the power delivered by the source will be less than its available power. And so, once again, uh, as I've emphasized before, a match load does not result in a conjugate match. Um, they both have the word match, yes, in both of those phrases, but they are two completely different things. A conjugate match occurs between an equivalent source and an equivalent load such that the, they are related by complex conjugate. And in that case, we can say the power absorbed by the equivalent load is equal to the power delivered uh, by the, or the power available, I should say, from the source, the maximum rate at which that source can available uh, can deliver power. That is a conjugate match. A match load is simply a load that uh, means that uh, none of the uh, incident power is reflected. The reflected power is equal to zero, and that the input impedance of the line is equal to Z0. Those are the only two things we can say about a matched load, and uh, again, that may or may not result in a uh, conjugate match, and generally speaking, as we've seen here, it will not. Continuing further with this idea, let's consider the case where we have a matched source. Now, in this case, our load is still some arbitrary value, all right? So it's not a matched load. We just have a matched source. The source impedance is numerically equal to Z0. So we take some arbitrary value of ZL with some arbitrary transmission line, characteristic impedance and length, and it transforms ZL into some arbitrary value of ZN. It could be any complex number. And because it could be any complex number, it is very unlikely to be numerically equal to the complex conjugate of Z0. In fact, that would be Z0. And so if we have a match source and an arbitrary load, we have no conjugate match. Again, a match source now does not imply we have a conjugate match. Um, um, to uh, determine a conjugate match, we need to know something about the source and the load. Uh, and so simply by uh, making a magical value for the source does not uh, create a conjugate match. What happens when we have a match source? Well, in that case, we know the incident power is equal to the available. The incident power is equal to the available power uh, of that source. And we know that the um, uh, source impedance, if we 
treat the uh, transmission line as a source transformer, that source impedance will be numerically equal to Z0. Those are the only two things we know if we have a match source. Again, generally speaking, almost never does a conjugate match result. When it comes to available power, there are two mistakes that students make, and we just covered now the first of it. The mistake students make uh, where they say, gosh, if I have a match load, I have no reflected power. If I have no reflected power, I've obviously maximized the power absorbed by my load, and therefore the source is delivering the maximum amount of power it can, and by definition, that's equal to the available power. That is a statement made by students, but as we saw, I've just seen, hopefully, and you've seen, uh, that statement is, in general, incorrect. Now there's a second statement that students make with respect to available power that I want to address now. Uh, it likewise is a statement that is incorrect. And so this applies to a case where we have a conjugate match. Again, the first case that was incorrect, students apply to when we have a match load. In this case, we do have a conjugate match that exists. If we look at the source impedance to, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, left, then we find that it is the complex conjugate of the equivalent load impedance uh, to the right. And yes, in that case, we know that all of the available power of the source is, I'm sorry, yeah, the available power of the source is being delivered and then ultimately absorbed by that load. Now, here is the further statement that students will make. Well, if the power delivered by the source is the maximum it can uh, deliver, uh, it is available power, then clearly the incident power along that transmission line is equal to that available power. Again, the statement that they make is that the input, uh, if the input impedance is numerically equal to the source impedance, we have a conjugate match, the source is delivering all its available power, then clearly that available power is equal to the incident power. But that is not correct. The available power puts a limit on the power delivered by the source, but it puts no such limit on the incident power along the transmission line. And again, that seems strange that that's true, but it is a correct statement. So there are a string of facts that we need to put together and think about how they um, essentially interact with each other. The first one is that if we have a complex conjugate match uh, between source and load, then the power delivered by the source will be equal to the available power of that source. And of course, that will be absorbed by the load. By conservation of energy, the delivered power is always equal to the absorbed power. In the case of a conjugate match, that delivered power, absorbed power, is equal to the available power of the source. We also determined that the incident power uh, uh, along a transmission line, the uh, power of the incident wave, power incident on the load at the end, is going to be greater than the delivered power and therefore greater than the absorbed power. The only time that the incident power was equal to delivered power, absorbed power, is when the reflected power was equal to zero. And that's the case when the load was a match load numerically equal to Z0. Yet we've determined that the match load case does not create a conjugate match. And so the case where the incident power is equal to delivered power is different than the case where the delivered power is equal to the available power. And so we'll find that the incident power is greater than the delivered power even when we have a conjugate match. Let's say we have a complex conjugate match, then we know that the power delivered from the source is going to be equal to the available power, and that should be a power available, not a power absorbed there. The power delivered will be equal to the available power if we have a complex conjugate match, which means the absorbed power will be equal to the available power, which means the net power flow will be equal to the available power. But the net power flow, we know, is the difference between the incident power and the reflected power. Both incident and reflected are going to be positive uh, values, uh, non-zero values. And because the difference between those two things are equal to the available power, it means the larger of those two things, the incident power, must be larger than the available power. 
And so even though we have a complex conjugate match, even though the source is delivering energy at the highest rate possible, we find that even in that condition, the incident power will be greater than that available power. All right, the available will be equal to delivered, will be equal to absorbed, will be equal to the net. But because the reflected power in general will not be equal to zero, the incident power must be greater than that available power that is equal to the delivered power. Now, the problem with this is students are nervous about this result because it seems like it would violate some sort of conservation of energy. We have more incident power than we have power available from the source. That doesn't sound like that should be a, a proper thing to have happen. The conservation of energy statement relates the uh, power delivered from the source to the net power flow along the transmission line to the power absorbed at the end of the transmission line by the load. And we have a situation where uh, all of the available power of the uh, source is being delivered by the source. That means the net power is equal to that available power. The net power can never be larger than the available power. And the largest the net power can be uh, is when uh, the delivered power is uh, delivering all of its, uh, the sources delivering all of its available power. So this really gets back to sort of a philosophical discussion of, of uh, this idea of net power being the difference between the incident wave and the reflected wave. To a certain extent, these are mathematical artifacts that we have with respect to power. We have two terms in the telegrapher equation, and we identify each with respect to a uh, uh, propagating electromagnetic wave. And then we kind of make this uh, a little bit of a hand-wavy argument where we say, power associated with the plus wave and power associated with the minus wave. In the end, all we can measure, all that's physical, all that's real, is simply the difference between the two. The energy flowing down the line is the net power flow. We represent it as the difference between the incident and reflected, and mathematically it all works out. But there really isn't a incident power that we could isolate and, and mine for energy to uh, violate conservation of energy. I tell students this is very much like we do in accounting. Um, you have someone that has, uh, let's say, zero net worth. Um, uh, you might say, well, if they have no net worth and they, you know, the net worth being the difference between your assets and your liabilities, uh, that's your net worth. If you have no net worth, you may have no assets and no liabilities. Zero minus zero, that's equal to zero. But we could have someone that has uh, millions or tens of millions of dollars in assets that still has no net worth. And that would occur, of course, if they have a commensurate amount of uh, liabilities, an equal amount, uh, rather, of liabilities, so that the difference between the two is still, is still zero. If someone loans me a million dollars, I suddenly have, they hand me over a million dollars and, and, uh, and uh, loan it to me, I borrow it from them, suddenly I have a million dollars, I have a million dollars of assets. But my net worth is still zero because I owe that person a million dollars as well. My liabilities are equal to a million dollars. So it's a little bit um, uh, ephemeral uh, to uh, argue that, uh, that I'm wealthy if I borrow a million dollars. And that's kind of what's going on again in the case of net power flow. We may have a very high incident uh, power associated with the incident wave, but if we have exactly the, uh, actually that's a, I just realized there's a typo, that should be incident minus reflected, not uh, minus absorbed, incident minus reflected. So if we have a, you know, uh, heck, 10 gigawatts of, uh, of incident power, and uh, we have 10 gigawatts of reflected power, we still have zero uh, net power, and that's the important power with respect to conservation of energy. One more point we'll make. Students sometimes think, oh, okay, well, the incident power can be greater than the available power if we have a complex conjugate match. Well, that's certainly true. It can be, but it doesn't have to be that case. In general, regardless of uh, the uh, load and source, when we have a certain amount of power being delivered and absorbed, a power that is uh, significantly less than the available power of the source, we still may find, uh, when we look at the amount of incident power that it might exceed the available power of the source. In other words, we really can't say anything about how the available power of the source will limit uh, the incident power. All we can say is the available power will put an upper limit on the net power uh, along that transmission line, the difference between the incident and the reflected power. As uh, 
I've been uh, discussing this. I uh, you probably notice I use uh, weasel words like you know generally speaking and usually and almost certainly uh, to describe uh, many situations and and uh, what I'm trying to say there is that uh, um, uh, you know we can't say it's it's going to be but it might be. Oftentimes when I say usually or generally, it means there is a situation where this could be true. It just in general isn't. And one of those cases was the case of a match load. I say that the match load, uh, generally speaking, will not absorb all of the available power of the source, that the power absorbed by a match load will be less than the available power of the source because a match load, of course, in general, will not create a conjugate match. All those mean that there is a situation where it could absorb all of the available power of the source. So we ask ourselves, what is that situation? Certainly, if we have a match load, we know that the reflected power is going to be equal to zero. And so the power absorbed by that load, that match load, will be equal to the incident power. And so in order for that absorbed power to be equal to the available power, we must have a situation where the incident power is precisely equal to the available power of the source. We then make this statement that if our load is a match load numerically equal to Z0, then it will absorb an amount of power, it will absorb energy at a rate equal to the available power of the source only if that incident power, which is the power that it absorbs, only if the incident power is equal to the available power of the source. And so now we ask ourselves, when will, under what conditions, would the incident power be equal to the available power? Again, we went through and said, in general, the incident power will be greater than the available power. But in this case of a match load, we know the incident power is the absorbed power. And so um, uh, that absorbed power would only be equal to the available power if the incident power is equal to the available power. Under what conditions does this occur? Well, it is one of the special cases that we discussed earlier. Remember, when we have a matched source, in other words, the source impedance is numerically equal to Z0, we found under that condition that the incident power is equal to the available power of that matched source. So we come to the conclusion, of course, as we did earlier, that the incident power will be equal to the available power of the source if we have a matched source. The source impedance is numerically equal to Z0. We put that together with the statement that uh, uh, the uh, um, uh, power absorbed by a, uh, a load will be equal to the incident power if we have a matched source and a matched source only such that the reflected power is equal to zero. We put those situations together and we find that if we have a matched source and we have a matched load, then the incident power along the transmission line will be equal to available power and all of that incident power will be absorbed by the load. In other words, the power absorbed by the load will be equal to the available power of the source if we have both a match source and a match load. Now, remember, and this is the important thing, this is if, but it's not only if. There are many situations in terms of sources and loads that aren't matched where the available power of the source will be absorbed by the load. If we establish a conjugate match, then all of the available power will be absorbed by that load. And there are an infinite number of ways to establish a conjugate match. Most of them uh, don't involve a source impedance uh, that is numerically equal to Z0 or a load impedance that's numerically equal to Z0. We can have a conjugate match between arbitrary source and load impedances as long as they are related by complex conjugate. <clears throat> This is one way to bring about, though, a conjugate match. One way where the available power of the source is delivered, all of it equal to the low. Just one way. But this is a very special way and a very desirable way. Because this way is one where this is true regardless of the transmission line length. Nowhere in the statements do we say anything about how long the transmission line needs to be. It can be of any arbitrary length. 
If the source is a match source, the incident power is equal to the available power. And if the load is a match load, then there's no reflection and all that incident power is absorbed. And that's true regardless of the transmission line length. It is but one way to create this situation, but it is the most desirable because it is independent of that transmission line length. So with respect to microwave engineering, this is the perfect situation. We have a match source and we have a match load. Under that condition, we have no reflected power, which means the absorbed power by the load will be equal to the incident power. But because we have a match source, that incident power will be equal to its available power. So in this case, all the available power from this match source will be absorbed by this match load, and that is independent of line length L. Again, this is not the only way to create a situation where we have a conjugate match, where all the available power is absorbed by the load. This is just one way, but it is the only way in, in, in wherein we don't have to take into account the length of that transmission line. We can alter the length of the transmission line as long as we keep the source and load to be a match load, then a conjugate match uh, results. Again, this sometimes uh, is confusing for students, and sometimes students get annoyed at me because I make a big deal about a match source and a match load um, uh, is not, um, uh, you know, does not mean a conjugate match. It is true that if we have both a match source and a match load, then a conjugate match will, will result and the available power will all be absorbed by the load. But it does not have to occur in that way. There are lots of circuits where a conjugate match occurs and neither the source nor the load are numerically equal to Z0. Again, there's some arbitrary complex number. As long as they're related by complex conjugate, then all the available power will be absorbed by the load. But this, again, is the perfect situation for microwave engineering because it alone is independent of that transmission line length.